We're in the midst of a sermon series called The Fabulous Life of Elijah. We've been looking at the prophet and the way that God used him and, and how those life lessons apply to our lives. So we started out by talking about Elijah and that great victory on Mount Carmel when he defeated the prophets of Baal and the prophets of Asheroth and he, he demonstrated God's power because he called upon God. God sent down fire. It not only consumed the sacrifice and the wood and the water, it even consumed the very stones of the altar. And then over Thanksgiving week, uh, Thanksgiving weekend, we heard that story of how God provided for Elijah in a time of severe famine, and he sustained him and gave him everything that he needs in the very same way that he provides what we need. And last weekend, we circled back and we talked about the aftermath. After, after his great victory on Mount Carmel, how Queen Jezebel threatened Elijah's life and it sent him into a, into a depression and a discouragement and he ran off into the wilderness and he thought he, he wanted to die, felt like he couldn't bear any more. But God spoke to him in that still, small, but powerful voice and reminded him that it's not by his strength but by God's strength alone that, that victory comes in our lives. Well, today we're going to fast forward, and we're going to move from that place fairly early in Elijah's ministry all the way to the end of his ministry, end of his earthly days, just before he's caught up into heaven in a chariot of fire. And we're going to talk about this process by which he passed the torch, the mantle of his responsibility, his prophetic ministry from himself to Elisha. Before we get to that, uh, you know, this idea of passing our faith along is central to the Christian gospel. Every one of us who claims the name Christian also is called not only to trust in God, but to pass along that faith to the people in our lives, friends and neighbors and co-workers, but especially the people in our own family, our homes, our children, and our grandchildren. The memory verse for this weekend uh, speaks to that from Psalm 78. Will you read it with me? We will not hide them from their children. We will tell the next generation the praiseworthy deeds of the Lord, his power and the wonders he has done. That comes in a, a whole psalm where the psalmist is declaring God's glory and his might and assuring, making an absolute promise before God that he is going to continue to, to tell about God's deeds and to tell about God's grace and to tell about God's love with all of his strength. But again, it's no surprise. It goes back to the earliest days of faith. In fact, in Deuteronomy chapter 4, pardon me, Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4, we, we have the very first profession of faith, the very first creedal statement. And remember that this creedal statement is powerful because as the people of Israel are living in a time where there are all kinds of gods, there's a God of the, of the soil and a God of the sun and a God of the, the stars and a God of the wind and a God of the water, that God declares there are not all of these gods, there is one God, I am the one God. So Deuteronomy chapter 6 verse 4 is that statement that says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God is one. But then it goes on. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. These commandments that I give you today are to be upon your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them to your foreheads. Write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. So we have this declaration that, that our God is one, that he is one God. And that we are to love him with all our heart and soul and strength. And then, do you get the picture? We're to surround ourselves with those reminders. We're to surround ourselves with conversation. And we're to make sure that those conversations and those reminders of our God and his goodness and his grace and his love and his care and his provision for us, that that's to be passed on to our children. That we are to talk with them when we get up and when we lie down. We're to talk with them when we're eating at our meal table. We're to talk with them when we're walking along the road. In other words, our God is to surround us and fill us and overflow into the lives of the people around us. 
carries us all the way forward to today where the Christian church is built upon the, the solid rock of Jesus who said, batter down the gates of hell and share that message of forgiveness and hope. Where Jesus said, go to all the world making disciples. Or as we oftentimes refer to it, he said, go and shine like stars in the universe as you hold out that message of life. We're to pass the torch. So when you think about that, when you think about that phrase, that idiom, pass the torch, what do you think of? You know, one of the things that came to mind, in fact, I, I posted it on Facebook, but I didn't think of it until Friday, and so it was kind of late, but I still got all kinds of responses. One of the things we think of when we think of pass the torch are traditions, right? And of course, there's no season that has more traditions built into it than the Christmas season. In fact, I remember years ago when I was doing lots of premarital counseling, the program we used was called Prepare and Rich, and it's been updated since then. But one of, the, one of the questions that was there, see, the idea of the program is not to identify compatibility. It's to identify areas where couples have had lots of communication and where they've had little communication. So that, so that you can kind of make them aware of the fact that they've got some bumps coming up along the road and, and not to lose hope, but to realize they're going to have to work some things through. One of the things on that, on that inventory was about Christmas. Because you know there are really only two kinds of people, right? There are the Christmas Eve gift openers. How many do we have of those in here? Raise your hand high. Don't be ashamed if it's you. Okay. And then there are the Christmas Day gift openers. Okay. It looks like we may have more of those in this service. It was about 50-50 earlier. But that's one of those traditions, right? And if you do it on Christmas Eve and your family's always done it on Christmas Eve, that's a big deal. If you do it on Christmas Day and you've always done it on Christmas Day, that's a big deal. And when you mix two couples, two traditionally mixed couples can be a big problem, right? You know, I love that you shared other traditions. You talked about, you talked about, you know, family traditions, gift opening traditions. On the Facebook page, you, you posted some food traditions. Some of you are very disgusting, by the way. But what was really cool is, is that many of you posted traditions that talked about the integration of your faith and Christmas in a beautiful way. Christmas Eve services or special readings from God's Word or special things you do to keep Christ at the heart and center of this special season. Dear friends, this is a, this is a part of our lives, not just at Christmas. This passing of the torch is something we're called to do every day single day. Now, you know, the idea of passing the torch, that idiom actually comes to us from ancient Greece. And of, of recent times, since 1939, it's been associated with the Olympic Games, but in ancient Greece, it wasn't part of the Olympics. It was a special a religious ritual where they would run, and they would have this nighttime race, and they would carry the torches out of necessity to see the path they were running on. But in 1939, it was, it was added as a part, as a way to light the Olympic cauldron and signal the beginning of the games. And I have to tell you, every year I look forward to seeing how they're going to do it in the new year, right? How that host city has figured out a new way to make all of that happen. Well, today I want to take a look at the life of Elijah and his relationship with his protege and his successor, Elisha, to see three things. I think there are three principles, three ideas that we need to keep in mind about how we pass the torch of our faith. So let's take a look. Let's go back to the text. When the Lord was about to take Elijah up to heaven in a whirlwind, Elijah and Elisha were on their way from Gilgal. Elijah took his cloak, rolled it up, and struck the water with it. The water divided to the right and to the left, and the two of them crossed over on dry ground. You know, what's interesting to me is that this relationship between Elijah and Elisha isn't something that just sort of happened. God instructed Elijah to choose Elisha to be his successor, but he instructed him to do that 20 years before this point in time. So they've grown to know each other well and trust each other and love each other. 
Elijah and Elisha have become spiritual father and son. And so this scene where they know that God is going to take Elijah up to heaven, this scene is packed with emotion. Not just the anticipation of the end of one great ministry, the beginning of the next, but it's packed with grief and this sense of loss. But you know, the very first thing that occurs to me in this idea of passing the torch and what we observe in the life of Elijah is that first and above all, before anything else happens, Elijah has the privilege of watching Elijah at work. Watching how he lives, what he does, how he prays, how he interacts with people, what he does when God gives him an instruction. Elisha has the benefit of seeing what it's like to be a man of God. And you know, dear friends, it's true in our lives. When it comes to passing along our faith, passing this torch of belief in Jesus Christ, one of the most obvious things we need to recognize is that the people around us, and especially the people in our homes, our children and our grandchildren, they're looking at us to see how we live, to see what we do. They pay attention to the priorities we set, to the words we speak, to the things that we laugh at, to the jokes that we tell, to the way that we live our lives, because what we do and what we say and how we live matters. Every one of us is called to be that witness, and so the things that we allow in our lives and the things we establish as priorities, it has an impact on the people who come after us because they're always watching. You know, I had a, an opportunity yesterday to be part of a memorial service. And it was one of those situations where the, the lady was 85. She had been sick and infirm for a number of years. And so the pastor that had been her pastor at her home church was gone. And the pastor that was there had previous commitments and wasn't available to do the service. And so, because one of the daughters is a member here at Concordia, I offered to do that. And I thought, I thought I was doing something nice for this family. But you know, as God often works it out, I was the one who was blessed. Because I got to hear the stories and, and be around this family as they told about this faithful, wonderful lady. Her name was Gloria. That's appropriate for the season, isn't it? And this lady suffered through all kinds of trials and all kinds of hardships. Uh, honestly, it's, it's an amazing story of a pained and difficult life that was blessed to overflowing with God's grace. And despite all of the odds against everything that should have, have weighed to make her a miserable, embittered person, she was a person who was characterized by unconditional love. She had three priorities, her God, her family, and her rose garden. And apparently this lady was some kind of rose gardener. Now, I I like roses. Do you like roses? Anybody grow roses? You know, I've got some roses in the backyard because I love the way they look and I love the way they smell and I, I love to look out on our back porch and see them out there. But I'm the kind of rose gardener that plants the bush and then waters them and waits to see what God's going to do. Not this lady. Gloria researched and, and did all kinds of things, and, and she created this concoction that she would, she would use on her roses, and apparently she had the most amazing roses ever. People would, would be driving down the street and stop and come in and ask her if, she could have a, if they could have a rose from that bush. And she loved them, and she was devoted to them. But here's the thing, the story that really grabbed my heart. Every year, the first blooms that would arrive, no one could take them, no one could cut them, no one could even touch them until they were ready, and she would cut them and then place them on an altar in her home in honor of Jesus. What a beautiful thing. Do you, think, do you think that that year in and year out tradition had an impact on her family? I have to tell you, I never met this lady to the best of my knowledge. 
But that precious tradition touched my heart. What we do, what we say, how we live, living our lives above reproach matters. Because the people who are coming after us, the people to whom we want to share that incredible gift of faith, they're watching. In Philippians 2, the passage that we talk about with one another so often, Therefore, my dear friends, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you to will and to act according to his good purpose. So do everything without complaining or arguing so that you may become blameless and pure children of God without fault in a crooked and depraved generation in which you shine like stars in the universe as you hold out the word of life. What we do, what we say, matters. And it's a part of how we pass the torch of faith to the next generation. Well, the text goes on. When they had crossed the Jordan, Elijah and Elisha, Elijah said to Elisha, Tell me what I can do before I'm taken from you. Let me inherit a double portion of your spirit, Elisha replied. You've asked for a difficult thing, Elijah said. Yet if you see me when I am taken up from you, it will be yours. Otherwise, not. As they were walking along and talking together, suddenly a chariot of fire and horses of fire appeared and separated the two of them, and Elijah went up to heaven in a whirlwind. You know, it's interesting. I get the scene, right? They've known each other. They've grown to love each other. This is a 20-year-long relationship between spiritual father and spiritual son. And Elijah knows that his time is very, very short, as does Elisha. And so it's his heart's desire to, to do something for him, to pass something along, to make his life easier, to encourage him. And so he says, what can I do for you? But what you can't possibly expect is what Elisha says in response. I want a double measure of your spirit. Now, he doesn't say that in a contentious way or in a, a haughty way or a competitive way. What I think Elisha is saying is literally, Father Elijah, I'm not half the man you are, so I need twice as much faith. I need twice as much of God's blessing in my life to carry out this ministry, to be who I've been called to be. And Elijah says, you know, that's, that's a pretty tough thing. And this is, where, this is where it got confusing to me because Elijah can't possibly give Elisha a double measure of his spirit because Elijah didn't create the spirit in the first place. This gift of faith, this gift of God's spirit isn't something that he earned or he deserved or that he can pass on like an inheritance. It's something that God gave to him as a gift. But I think that's why he says what he does. He says, you've asked for a hard thing, but if you see me when I am taken up to heaven, you'll have it. For a long time, I, I thought, what in the world is he trying to say? What is that all about? And then it occurred to me that Elijah is saying to Elisha, if you see this incredible miracle that God is going to do, if you with your own eyes see God swoop down and carry me to heaven in a chariot of fire, your faith will be so strengthened you will have that gift you're asking for. You know, as I thought about that, I thought how often, how important it is for the people in our lives to see God working miraculously in and through us. Because there are no people who know our frailties. There nobody knows how broken and flawed we are like our children and our grandchildren. But when they see God working miraculously, extending beyond our boundaries and our limits to raise up a life of honor and of glory to God, that's a powerful thing. In fact, that brings me back to something I said last weekend that I want to I circle back to. Remember, I, I asked you this question. How many of you have heard or maybe even said, God never gives you or never permits in your life more than you can possibly handle? And then I, I very quickly said, don't raise your hand, right? Remember that? 
Because while we hear that all the time, it's a truism in our world, the reality is it is not in the Bible and it is not true. We do receive more than we can handle. We do receive more than we can bear. We do live in a life where the pain and the struggle and the overwhelming obstacles and the sin in our own lives is more than we can possibly manage. Now, to help you understand this, someone sent me a note and, and a couple of other folks were asking questions. They say, well, isn't that, isn't that what Paul's talking about in 1 Corinthians chapter 10? And so I want to go to that passage. Let's look at verse 12 and verse 13. So if you think you are standing firm, be careful that you don't fall. No temptation has seized you except what is common to man. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. The thought being that that's a, that that's a paraphrase. That that's, that's where that statement, that's where that idea comes from. But dear friends, I want to I point out something to you. In fact, two things. Number one, this verse is talking about temptation. It's not talking about the pain. It's not talking about the struggle. It's not talking about the general hurts and wounds and agonies of this life. It's talking specifically about temptation. But let me point out one other thing. That even in this verse, when it says God is faithful, in fact, let's put it back up there. God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. If you read only that, it sounds like it's saying you're never going to be tested beyond your own ability to resist. But do you see what it goes on to say? But when you are tempted, he, and the he means God, he will also provide a way out so that you can stand up under it. See, brothers and sisters, even when it comes to temptation, we don't stand before the devil or our own sinful flesh by our own strength or our own power or our own resolve. We stand before those temptations and before the pain and heartache and struggles and strife of this world by the power of God in us. In fact, it's the same Apostle Paul who in 2 Corinthians chapter 1 says, we think you ought to know, dear brothers and sisters, about the trouble we went through in the province of Asia. We were crushed and overwhelmed beyond our ability to endure. And we thought we would never live through it. In fact, we expected to die. But as a result, we stopped relying on ourselves and learned to rely on God, who raises the dead. And he did rescue us from mortal danger, and he will rescue us again. We have placed our confidence in him, and he will continue to rescue us. You see, it's so very important for us to understand that, that what really makes the difference while the world, while our children and our grandchildren, while our friends and neighbors are watching our lives and what we do and what we say matters, ultimately, all of us come to the end of our ability and the end of our strength, the end of our clarity, the end of our means, the end of something, and we reach out into that place where we are no longer able to bear up under the stress except by God's grace, except by his strength. Do you remember Elijah? When he was so worn out and so frightened and so discouraged that he couldn't go on and he prayed that God would just kill him. But all it took was that still, small voice that reminded him that it's not his strength. It's by God's strength. That's what you and I need in our lives. Because this world is bigger and more powerful, and our adversary, the devil, is more tactically skilled and more clever than we could ever hope to be. So we are going to face over and over again things that are overwhelming and beyond our ability, but by the strength of our God, nothing is impossible. Well, that brings me to the last of my three points. People are watching what we do matters and passing the torch. That God is working in and through us 
And they see that miraculous power that defies explanation but bears witness to the God we trust. Elijah saw the chariot swoop down and the horses of fire. And he cried out, My father, my father, the chariots and horsemen of Israel. And Elisha saw him no more. Then he took hold of his own clothes and he tore them apart. And he picked up the cloak that had fallen from Elijah and he went back and stood on the bank of the Jordan. And when he took the cloak that had fallen from him and he struck the water with it, where now is the Lord, the God of Elijah? And when he struck the water, it divided into the right and to the left and he crossed over. You see what happens? For 20 years, Elisha has been watching Elijah, and for 20 years, he's been seeing God work through this prophet, but now is the moment of truth. Now Elisha stands on the bank with that same cloak, and he strikes the water, and essentially he says, God, are you here? Are you going to work in my life? And the thing that we need to remember, my third point for you today, is that when it comes to passing this torch of faith, it is never going to be the actions or words of parrots. It's not even going to be the incredible witness of their lives that brings the gift of faith. It is always God's Spirit. You don't bear that responsibility. You don't have that power. But God's Spirit is working and it is active and he reaches out and he touches the hearts and lives of people. He claims them as his own and he gives that gift of faith. That's what Ephesians 2 is trying to say to us. Ephesians 2 verses 8 and following. God saved you by his grace when you believed and you can't take credit for this. You can't take credit for this. I can't take credit for this. No human power anywhere can take credit for this. It is the gift of God. Salvation is not a reward for the good things we have done, so none of us can boast about it. For we are God's masterpiece. Whose masterpiece? God's masterpiece. He's the creator. He's the redeemer. He's the sustainer. He is the one who gives that gift of faith and prepares that place in eternity, eternity for us. God's masterpiece. He's created us anew in Christ Jesus so that we can do the good things he planned for us long ago. It's God's plan. And God's power. And God's spirit. And God's gift of faith that's put in the hearts of everyone who believes. You know, that, that started me thinking again about the Olympic torch ceremony. You know, one of my very, very favorite Olympic moments is from 1992 when the Olympics were in Barcelona. Anybody know what I'm gonna talk about now? And that incredible moment where in that, in that torch race, the flame was finally delivered and that last act to light the cauldron, and it was way up in the air. Let's watch and see what the story says. He considered himself the lucky one. They contemplated many others. When he was eight months old, he was not lucky. Antonio Raboyo contracted polio, both legs affected, the right one severely. His disability, the impetus for participating in sports. I simply wanted to do things that challenged me. I'm very proud of my accomplishments. I wouldn't change my life. It's almost a blessing that I had polio. The difficulties I've had in my life enabled me to overcome many obstacles. He was one of 200 archers considered. Sunrise practices, wind machines simulating different weather conditions, flaming arrows so close as to singe fingers. Now, the night of the opening ceremonies, he was one of four archers that waited for their moment. Two hours before the actual release, Antonio was chosen. I began to prepare myself mentally, which Olympic archers normally do. It consists of deep concentration and putting aside all distractions from my mind to focus on the moment of shooting the arrow. 
the level of concentration, there were no fears. I was practically a robot. I focused on my positioning and reaching the target. That was all. It was over in a moment, but oh, what a moment. In seconds, Antonio had become forever a part of Olympic history. My feelings were taken from the public who described to me how they saw it, what they felt, their emotions, their cries. This is what made me realize what the moment actually meant. That was a great scene, wasn't it? And you know, as, as I think about that, something occurs to me. While Ant Antonio had this incredible, victorious moment, He's not the one who created the flame. It was just passed on to him, and he did what his job was to pass it along and light that cauldron. Dear friends, you and I, we don't light the flame of faith. We're called by God to simply pass it along, to be faithful in our words and faithful in our actions, but always know and trust that it is God's Spirit who lights that torch. Now, in this, in this next couple of weeks, there's a special window that opens, isn't there? It's this interesting intersection between our culture and Christianity called Christmas. And while we can lament the idea that, that Christmas is, is being hijacked or it gets gets confused or we get distracted by so many other things, rather than lamenting all of that, dear friends, my prayer is that we will celebrate that we have an opportunity in this, in this short window to speak boldly to the lives and to the hearts of our friends, to share with our loved ones and our family, to pass along to our children in this Christmas season what Christmas is really about, the hope and the power of a tiny baby and the still small voice of our God. You know, I don't know how you will do it. Maybe it'll be by passing out some of those cards and inviting people to the drive through nativity or, or coming with them to a Christmas Eve service or, or maybe it's in a Christmas letter that you write and you tell them, you share your faith. Maybe it's in something else you'll do, serving in Christmas from the heart or some other wonderful way of sharing the hope that lives in you. But my point is, dear friends, don't miss this window because it's our responsibility to the best of our ability with the strength and opportunity God gives to pass the torch of faith. Let's pray. Kind Heavenly Father, we are grateful for your love, for all that you have done for us in your Son, Jesus Christ, and that you have called us, Lord, that you would be willing to use frail and broken people like us to share the hope of eternity in your Son. Lord, bless us with boldness and clarity and faith. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, dear friends, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. May he look upon you with his favor and give you his peace. And as you leave this place, go into the world and shine like stars in the universe as you hold out the message of life. Amen.